Introducing YouTube memberships, a fun way to support the channel while getting some exclusive perks. Click the join button to become a member now and get benefits like badges next to your name on videos, behind the scenes photos, advantages during the live trivia game, discounts on merchandise, private one-on-one -on -one video chats, the ability to request future video topics, and exclusive 8-10 to 10 minute videos on the history of the NFL. And now, on with our feature presentation. When you think of men that coached themselves out of the Hall of Fame with a disastrous ending to their career, odds are, the first name, and maybe the only name that comes to mind, is this man right here, George Seifert. His time with the San Francisco 49ers was nothing short of brilliant, and you can learn more about that by clicking the card in the upper right corner. After Bill Walsh retired following the 1988 season, Sifa picked up right where Walsh left off, continuing the 49ers dynasty into the first half of the 1990s and winning two Super Bowls. Winning Super Bowl 24 with maybe the most dominant playoff run of all time, and winning Super Bowl 29 with maybe the most dominant offense performance in Super Bowl history. Seifert went 98-30 and 30 in his eight seasons at the helm, winning over 76% of his games, as his team made the playoffs in all but one season and won at least 10 games in all eight seasons. And if Seifert never coached another game after that, odds are he would be in the Pro Football Hall of Fame right about now. But then he decided to come out of retirement to coach for the Carolina Panthers. And then the results were not pretty, as his three years in charge of the Panthers, where he went 16-32, and 32, were so bad that all of his harshest critics were proven right that Seifert wasn't a good coach, but rather was just given an insanely talented roster in San Francisco that anyone could have won with. Whether you agree with that or not is up to you, but the Panthers' stint definitely did not help matters. And after an abysmal 2001 season where the Panthers went 1-15, finishing with the worst record in the league and their worst record in franchise history, he never coached another game in the NFL. That 2001 season was a disaster for Seifert in so many ways, and I talked about one forgotten moment of his disastrous stint with the Panthers already, which you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner. But this moment was absolutely terrible as well, and highlighted just how bad Seifert was down in Carolina. Imagine announcing to the world that your quarterback is severely injured and is going to miss some time, all without telling your quarterback this, and all while your quarterback feels perfectly healthy and fine. Well, after a game between the Carolina Panthers and the Miami Dolphins, that's exactly what George Seifert, for some reason, decided to do. And man, did that sum up the dysfunctional mess that he was running. Because this is the story behind one of the dumbest moments in George Seifert's entire career. Before I talk about the actual incident in question, we need some context to understand the game at hand, how it was going, and who the quarterback was that was involved in this entire saga. It's November 4th, 2001. It's week 8 of the NFL season. And as we're approaching the halfway point of the year, we've got an interconference battle, and oddly enough, the first ever meeting in Miami between these two teams, as the Carolina Panthers are taking on the Miami Dolphins down at Pro Player Stadium. On this rainy and gloomy day down in South Beach, no one, not a single person, expects the Panthers to win this game. And let's be very clear on that. Their season is completely shot by this point. They've lost six straight games, having not won since the first week of the season, and they're going up against the Miami team that enters this one at 4 2, that has been mainstays in the playoffs for the past few seasons, and that enters this one as 10 point favorites. It would be a minor miracle if the Panthers could somehow pull this one off and snap their six game losing streak, seeing as this is a team lacking any sort of pulse, but you never know. Crazier things have happened. Unfortunately for the Panthers, it doesn't quite work out that way at the start, as the offense struggles heavily behind this man right here, Chris Wanky. The former Heisman winner was drafted by the Panthers earlier in the year in the fourth round at the ripe old age of 29, and the season had not exactly gone according to plan. By this point in the season, he was arguably the worst starting quarterback in football, having thrown six touchdowns and 11 interceptions 
with a touchdown to interception ratio approaching 1 to 2, at a time when the league wide average was well above 1 to 1. And after throwing four interceptions two weeks ago in a loss to Washington, he was coming off of the worst scheme of his career the previous week against the New York Jets, where he lost while going 12 for 34, completing 35% of his passes for 76 yards, no touchdowns, one interception, and a passer rating of 31.7, which is worse than if he did nothing but spike the ball into the ground on every single play. And this game against the Dolphins, as you can tell, was shaping up to be no better. Not in the slightest bit. Midway through the third quarter, while Carolina's defense was holding its own and was playing fairly well, having allowed just two field goals and no touchdowns on eight Miami drives, the Panthers were still down 13-6, thanks to another dreadful outing by Winky, who was 9-21 for 21 with 158 yards, no touchdowns, one interception, and a passer rating of 49.3. That one interception, by the way, was a pick six to Patrick Sertan. Hence why Miami had a touchdown despite not scoring one on the offensive side of the ball. And adding insult to injury, quite literally, was the fact that Wanky was injured during this game. He sprained his throwing shoulder during the first half, and while he took a shot of Novakine to try and play in the second half, after a poor sequence of events on the first drive of the half, where he threw two straight incompletions and went three and out, Seifer pulled Wanky from the game. Said Seifer on the decision to take him out, Chris got an AC sprain in his right shoulder. Team physicians injected it with a painkiller. He was cleared to play, and he went in at the beginning of the second half. But I felt like it was affecting him. It was my decision to take him out. I just didn't want to press it. I thought making the change was the best move as far as Chris was concerned, and us. Alright, no issues there. Wakey was playing terribly and he was hurt, and there's no controversy there. But with Wakey's injury and subsequent yanking from the game, it meant that a new quarterback has to come in. Enter this man right here, about to make his first throws in the NFL, Damian Craig. Craig had never thrown a pass in the league before in a regular season game, with his last action in a competitive game coming back in NFL Europe in 1999 with the Scottish Claymores. Now, he was not only getting an opportunity to do so, but he was doing it against the Miami Dolphins, as in, the team that got him into football in the first place. Said Craig, You've always got to be ready to play. You're excited about it. He then added on that, I've been watching the Dolphins all of my life. They were my favorite team growing up. I was thinking on the way over to the game. Wouldn't it be funny if I got a chance to go in there against them? The next thing I knew, I was out there. Craig got his chance. Against his childhood team, he was about to play his first bit of real NFL football. Now the results were admittedly not great. He went 4 for 8, he had a failed 4th down conversion, he had a fumble, and his 3 drives ended with just 55 yards of offense, as the Panthers failed to score, ultimately losing the game by a final score of 23-6. But at least for Craig, after years of waiting for his chance, he finally got out there, even if he did have to leave a bit early with a foot injury, meaning that Carolina was down to their third string quarterback to close out the game. Now after the game, Seeper was asked about the play of Craig, how he performed, and how he was doing in terms of the foot injury that caused him to leave the game early. And this is where things get bizarre, and quite frankly, really stupid. To the point where you wonder how this man was the man in charge of multiple Super Bowl winning teams. I should note that Craig, while he did have to leave the game, knew that his foot was not broken, and that even though it hurt, the x-rays taken of his foot came back negative, which is a positive. Because Seifert said, quite bluntly, it looks like it's fairly significant. Somebody said it would be four to six weeks. All right. So Seifer gave the injury diagnosis to the press, and said how long his backup quarterback was probably going to be out. No problems there. This meant that naturally, the reporters were going to ask Craig about his injury status, how he was feeling, and what's next after the diagnosis. As for what Craig said, 
he was absolutely confused for a few reasons. Number one, he felt fine. But number two, oh yeah, no one told him about the diagnosis. Seriously. George Seeper just announced to the world that Damien Craig was going to be out for four to six weeks. And Craig's first reaction was, Wait, what are you talking about? Said Craig on this? What? Who said that? They haven't told me anything yet. Which seems like kind of a big deal. You kind of want to tell your players this kind of stuff before you announce it to the world. Especially since it pertains to them. Craig even said that he thought he had a chance of being back out on the field on Wednesday. Which is definitely not within the 4-6 to six week timetable. As Craig then said, They haven't told me anything yet. I'll be back before 4 weeks. I can tell you that. I've been waiting too long to get out there. I've been waiting 4 years to get in there. So let me get this straight. In one corner, you have a coach who's announcing to the world that his quarterback is going to be out for an extended period of time because his foot is feeling pretty bad. And in the other corner, you have a player who has no idea about this, who has not been told the peep about this, and is looking at the reporters like they have three heads when he found this out for the first time, because he genuinely had no idea. Imagine if, at your job, your boss holds a remote meeting and says to start the meeting off that you won't be able to work for the next few days because you've got some bad migraines and need some time off. Meanwhile, you had no idea that you even had migraines. You feel perfectly fine, and you had no idea that, apparently, you weren't healthy enough to work. No one told you that. And look, players, especially people like Craig, have a tendency to lie about their status all the time. They're warriors. They play through pain. Especially when you've been waiting years and years to get your chance, and when you've dreamt your whole life about playing in the NFL, Nothing short of dying is going to keep you off the field if you can help it. So I'm not saying that because Craig thought he could play and Seepert said he couldn't, that Seepert was a bad head coach. That is not the point of this. Do not take that away from this. But what I am saying is that if you are going to announce to the world that a player is going to be out with an injury for an extended period of time, at the very least, Tell the player about the diagnosis before announcing it. Especially if the player doesn't feel a considerable amount of pain and has no idea what you're talking about. Communication is absolutely paramount. And the fact that Seeper did this without even talking to Craig before and letting him know, hey, the diagnosis doesn't look good. And the doctors think you're going to be out for a few weeks. And instead, he just did this on the fly and let Craig deal with the questions afterwards to a prompt that he was completely unprepared for and came as a shock to him, and understandably so, is just wrong on so many levels. It's so dysfunctional. How you don't tell Craig this, I have no clue. But if anything summed up George Seifert's disastrous tenure in Carolina, it was this bizarre controversy right here. Unfortunately, this story doesn't have a happy ending for either party. After the game between these two teams behind me right here, Damian Craig had to get surgery on his foot, getting placed on injured reserve and missing the rest of the season. He would never play another snap in the NFL after that. It was more than four to six weeks. He was out for the entire season. As for George Seifert, he didn't win another game for the rest of his career. The Panthers lost out. They went 1-15, and Seeper got fired after a disastrous year and a disastrous stint in Carolina. In the end, no one was a winner. And the phrase, no one is a winner, pretty much sums up Carolina's entire 2001 season. So what's the moral of the story here? If you're going to be a good head coach, you have to know how to communicate. And this is just about the worst possible way to communicate. It's the worst way to do that. Not letting people know their own injury status, and instead, announcing it to the press and having it come as a complete shock to the player in question is a great way to lose whatever trust players had in you. If Seifert spoke to Craig beforehand, this would be a non-story. If Seifert said, we haven't spoken to Craig yet, and we don't know, 
We're gonna do some tests tomorrow, and we'll find out more then. Then once again, this would be a non-story. Just about any possible answer that Seifer gave, and just about any possible chain of events between Seifer and Craig, would make this a complete non-story that I would not be talking about more than two decades later. Except somehow, George Seifer chose the worst possible route and chose the worst possible option. Because in 2001, no one with a brain could see what Seifer was doing. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9 p.m. Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.